well. Um, so I'm head of physical sciences. My school is chemistry, physics, and earth science. It's one of the two schools on North Terrace. We also have biological sciences here. And then we have agriculture, food, and wine at the weight, and animal and vet sciences out at, at Roseworthy. You're sitting in the Braggs. This is one of our um, sort of newer lecture theaters and one of our newer science buildings. And so our first year practicals in, um, phys oh, sorry, in physics and in biological sciences are taught upstairs um, in this building. And it's, it's a building we're quite proud of. What we want to do this evening is we want to give you kind of an overview of what we are. We want to welcome you to sciences. Um, so most of the people, uh, the students here have applied to, to do stuff with us tell you a bit more about us, and then we'll have a Q&A with some current students, some current staff, including myself, and then we'll have a discussion out in the foyer where you can ask individual questions. So the idea is to try to answer all the questions that you have about what it might be like to study sciences at Adelaide. And this is a really, really exciting time to be studying science. There's so much going on in the state. So you know that South Australia is positioning itself as the defense state. So we've got the submarine build, but it's beyond, it goes beyond technology. There's a lot of science around that. There's also a lot of money um, across the nation going into defense, and a lot of that is going into South Australia. So that's a really, really big push, and there's going to be a lot of jobs in defense in South Australia. There's also a lot of other really cool stuff going on, and it involves science, it also involves technology. So for example, there's a proposal to build a solar thermal energy center in Port Augusta. And the idea here is basically that you harness the power of the sun, that you heat up material to a very, very hot temperature, and then you can use that to get 24 hour a day electricity. So it's about creating the solar energy, or harnessing the solar energy, but then storing it and then reusing it at the same time. Another big push in South Australia is around food technology. And one of the big things is around Sundrop Farms, again around Port Augusta, where they're doing completely sustainable agriculture, where they're, they're solar energy to desalinate water, to then do indoor harvesting or create, well, growing and then harvesting of crops. In the first instance, tomatoes. And there's also a lot going on in the northern suburbs and that will be building in terms of food technology. So again, big picture things happening in South Australia. But more globally, STEM and particularly science are the skills that, that people need in order to get ahead in the world and in our very, very rapidly changing world. So the skills that you learn by doing science involve active learning, critical thinking, and problem solving. And this is what employers want. And it doesn't have to be in terms of solving science problems. So, you know, everybody wants somebody who can think. And particularly in the age of automation, when robots are taking over more and more. And I don't know if you saw that Amazon now in the UK has had its first test delivery where somebody ordered online and a drone delivered the book to them, right? So automation is taking over a lot of mundane tasks, but the, the tasks that are going to have the jobs of the future are ones that involve thinking, and that's what employers want. The other thing is that there have been studies that said that about 75% of the fastest growing occupations require STEM skills. So again, it's that ability to think. It's that ability to work out problems. And it's also the soft skills, the ability to, to work and play well with others. Um, and you know, we're very proud of the fact that about 90% of science graduates, this is nation, nationally, are employed. And most of them attribute their STEM skills to that. And we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about employability, because sometimes it's not the first job but it's the second job and the third job and the fourth job. Because the first job, if you're kind of a typical student, and I was one of them, you know, you kind of go through university and all you're thinking about is getting done. Then you get done and go, oh, what do I do next? So you get a job at Kohl's or Woolies or something like that. And then you get your act together and, and, and you go out and you actively look for a job. 
we're trying to improve on that, and we've started a number of initiatives in the faculty right now where we're doing careers fairs for students in sciences, where we're bringing employers in, and we're having panel discussions with them and meet and greet about what employers are looking for. And from next year, we're trying to embed employability in basically the mentoring program that students will be talking about, but from year one, so that we're really actively trying to help students think about how they articulate the skills that they're developing as students into what employers want. And that's really, really important. So there's a lot of opportunity in terms of employability. There's also a lot in terms of things that aren't issues at the moment, but will be. Because the world is changing so rapidly. We have so many challenges that the young people in this room are going to have to deal with. Um, climate change is a huge one. You know, and we're seeing it all the time. I'm an American originally, as you can tell from my accent. Right now, the US is getting creamed with storms. And they're attributing those really bad winter storms to, uh, to warming of the Arctic. Okay? Here we're seeing, we see, seeing warming of temperatures not, you know, globally. We're seeing challenges to biodiversity. So these are areas in Australia where biodiversity is being threatened as a result of climate change. Here in Adelaide, rising sea levels and the effect on beach erosion, for example. So I think most people here have seen the effect of the winter storms this year on our beaches. And solving those issues is difficult, and it involves a lot of understanding of science. And those types of things are going to become more and more important. And so, for example, um, I don't know if people have seen the articles in uh, the ABC News and other news recently about melting in Antarctica. And so the thought is now that there's a warm current that's actually causing melting of part of the Antarctic um, um, glacier and the ice sheet. And that melting then will contribute to sea level rise in a very large way. This map on the top left is what one meter of sea, or 1.1 meter of sea level rise would do to northern Adelaide. I'm a bit parochial because I live just about there. Um, and, but this is Port Adelaide, and those are areas that would be underwater in 1.1 meter of sea level rise. So there's a lot of stuff around this in terms of understanding what might happen, and also in terms of adaptation and mitigation. And these are really science issues. So there's a whole range of future careers that don't exist at the moment, but will exist around adaptation to climate change. And that's just one of the many things that don't exist now, but will. So there's this whole idea of, of, disruptive, of disruptive technologies, of, of things that actually change the way we think and the way we work. And so the great example, and if I can do this without dropping the mic, is that we all have one of these in our pocket, right? And so it changes so much, not only that you, know, you can phone somebody straight away or you can check your email straight away, but that you have access to so much data and that so much data is being collected about you. you know? And that's one example, the growth of big data, the growth of 3D printing, um, climate change, of course. All these things are so quickly changing the world that you live in and that we will live in. And so to navigate that world and to be gainfully employed in that world, you've got to be able to think and you've got to be able to adapt. And we're in a world right now where things are changing so quickly and people are changing jobs. That this is a comment from the chief scientist of, um, earlier this year, making the distinction between job ready and job capable graduates. Because job ready means that you go out and you say, well, cool, I know how to do X, right? The question that he raises, or the point he makes, is that those people may not be adaptable. In other words, you could go out and do X, wonderful, but what happens when X doesn't exist anymore? Whereas the job-capable graduates are the people who can adapt, who can think, who can solve problems. Okay. 
And those are the skills that you will develop as a science student at Adelaide. And this is the, the bit I was trying to say about mobility. Right now, people are changing jobs all the time. It's going to happen more and more. So the great thing about studying science at the University of Adelaide is that the science that you'll study will be underpinned by fantastic research. What that means is that you're being exposed to absolutely cutting edge stuff and it's being taught to you by people who are doing groundbreaking science. Some examples of this, most of you have heard about the discovery of gravitational waves just earlier this year. The University of Adelaide contributed to that. And so we built a detection system, this isn't it, but we built a detection system in the physics building just up the hill and that was installed at LIGO and was part of that detection system. Okay, so fundamental advance in science. We're also doing fundamental research in terms of, of understanding and trying to prevent diseases. So this example is cataracts and it turns out that cataracts are caused by a protein and that one of our guys in chemistry is developing a molecule that can bind to that protein and it stops it from creating cataracts in your eye. So he's gotten 100 grand now to develop that research and it'll go from there. Um, so it could be longer term something that, that will be a routine eye drop for people like us. We're doing cutting edge science in veterinary science and animal science. Um, this is an example of um, an, an ovo, um, so an egg of a mouse and trying to understand diseases um, in the intestinal tract. This is stuff from weight, from agriculture, food and wine, where there's a cutting edge plant accelerator. This is really important for climate change, so you can see, you know, if we grow plants under a particular condition, what happens? If we now make it hotter, for example, do we have to water it differently? Do we fertilize it differently? How do we adapt? Okay. And this is another example. This is actually, again, from chemistry, where um, this is a plant that take, naturally takes up metals into the plant structure. You can use it for remediation of old mine sites, and then you can actually mine the, pl the plant itself for minerals or for, for yeah, for minerals, for metals. So again, cutting edge science. And the way that Adelaide works is that we have what's called small group discovery. So you don't spend all your time sitting in a big lecture theater like this, but you actually spend time in small groups solving problems and working with really good academics who do really good research. So you learn as a result of that. The other thing is that we have a lot of opportunities for study abroad, and this is from geology. This is an example of a recent study tour um, in Oman, just finished about three weeks ago, and I hope our health and safety officer isn't here uh, to look at that picture, but everybody came back alive and in good health and had a fantastic time. Um, so they spent 10 days out there, it was a, an intensive course, and from you know, everything I've heard, it was tremendous. So there's lots of opportunities to get overseas and to either experience completely new environments or to interact with different people. And it's such a global world that that's so important. And for people who don't want to do it, you don't have to, you're not forced to, but you have the opportunity. And just to give you an idea of where our graduates go, this is a snapshot just from one year. And you can see that people have dispersed all over the world, um, a lot in Australia, but also you know, elsewhere in Europe, in Asia, and in North America. And just a couple of examples of, of some of these. Um, Sarah and Peter both did physics, and they basically both ended up working in finance. So Sarah is a trading officer at an energy company, um, and Peter is working more or less for a venture capitalist company. Okay, so coming out of physics, very, very quantitative. Um, these are people who've done a, a range of things from chemistry, 
uh, with Jody to food science with Tammy and uh, I think environmental science with Ella. Um, again, all gainfully employed in, in different parts of Australia. Tammy, out of food science, is working for Deloitte and probably makes more money than anybody in this room, um, certainly more than I do. Um, and finally, I'll, I'll finish with a couple of comments. Um, so these are two of our students who both did chemistry. Uh, Patrick is working as an environmental scientist, as you can see. And it goes back to the skills thing. That, that, that STEM is about more, and science is about more than just a linear path, but it's about getting the skill set. So studying at the University of Adelaide helped me develop good problem solving and critical thinking skills that enabled me to gain employment in a difficult market. And it is a difficult market, um, face it. And then Sophie is actually working for skin can skincare manufacturer, um, been able to apply the problem solving, technical report writing, and data handling skills. So again, it's, it, it's about skills. So I want to thank you for your attention on that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn you over to Kira Lee, who will talk about the support that we give to students in sciences at Adelaide. And then we'll move over to a, a Q&A with a bunch of students and staff that I didn't introduce before, but are sitting there and we'll come back to them. Thank you. Hi, so as Sandy said, my name is Kira Lee and I work in the student experience team in the Faculty of Sciences office. So I'm more of an administrative role. And as part of that, um, yeah, I suppose my role is to help um, support your transition to university and study within sciences and support you through your program of study here with us. Um, so there's lots of different services that the university as a whole provides to all students studying at the university. Um, we have a global learning office, so as Sandy was mentioning, you can include in your program a global learning experience, whether that be a study tour or during the summer or winter period, or whether that's a semester or full year um, study, you, you can certainly include that. Um, we have the Maths Learning Centre, Writing Centre, so if you're having um, difficulties with maths problems, um, you can just pop in there at any time and get assistance, same with the Writing Centre. Um, if, you're writing reports and having difficulties there. Um, there's lots of ongoing support while you're here university-wide. Within the Faculty of Sciences, we have our Faculty of Sciences office. That's where I'm located. I may have spoken to some of you already. Um, so you can pop in at any time and come and ask us questions about sort of admission into programs, um, different programs that we have, different courses and requirements. Uh, we also have our academic drop-in centres. So if you're in, say, first year chemistry, you're having some difficulties understanding some content, you can go to those drop-in centres outside of class time and sit with an academic and get some help there as well. Our past sessions are similar to the academic drop-in centres, but they're run by um, students. So we say second or third year students, so they can help you um, work through those um, problems as well. So we have those for the majority of our first year um, disciplines, so you do get that extra support outside of your class time. Uh, you also have your first year directors with each of the disciplines, so they're also a good point of contact if you're needing just some like, extra resources to help with certain content. And we have also our program and course advisors, so you'll have an academic allocated to your program who will support you through your full program. And with the individual courses, um, you'll have academics as well. With our uh, um, commencing students in your first semester, we have our mentoring program. So this is a course that you enrol into. There's no fees, there's no assessment, there's no deadlines. It's basically just fun. So come along, meet all of um, your other first year students, network with them, and it's just, it's just a whole lot of fun. So I definitely recommend doing it. Um, yeah, it's a good networking thing and it's just relaxing as well. You will receive some phone calls probably or some touch base type um, contact from Succeed at Adelaide. So um, they'll basically just yeah, want to touch base with you, make sure that everything's going okay. This is also an opportunity for you to ask any questions if you're not sure of something. Just sometimes the phone ringing and you think, oh, yep, I need to ask that question. Um, so they're there as well for support. With our Next Step program, 
that's to help you with the transition from your first year going into second year. So at the end of your first year, you'll be able to sit down with an academic and get one-on-one -on -one advice around what you're wanting to do with your courses and the progression of your program going into second year. Um, so that's a really important program that we do and um, yes, yeah, students really benefit from that. Um, so with our first year experience program, we have a whole page on our Faculty of Sciences website um, and you'll find all the information about those drop-in centres, the past sessions, um, all of that information is contained there. And I'll hand over to Sandy again. So now we get to the interesting part, which is a chance to ask students um, and then later staff about what it's really like here. So we have a number of students here, and I'll ask them to get up one at a time and introduce themselves. Let's start. So my name's Jackson, and I'm just about to go into my honours year in marine biology. And yeah. I tried to describe uni on my first day. I thought it was pretty overwhelming, but thankfully here there's a lot of support to help you kind of ease into it. And yeah, Adelaide's a great place for all of that. Stay up. Hi, I'm Lisa Jensen, and um, I've finished my degree, and I'll be doing honours next year um, in. Um, geology and um, I remember my first day I found it very overwhelming but um, during my stay here I've had actually a lot of help and I've been able to actually give help back to other students as well so um, if you've got any questions about peer mentoring or past sessions you can also help out in answering those Hi guys, um, I'm Carolyn Mitchell. I'm currently in the third year animal science project, so I don't know if anyone here is interested in animal or veterinary sciences, um, but we're based out at Roseworthy, having a great time playing around with uh, lots of live animals. Um, first year, yeah, it's pretty hectic, um, especially your first day, you kind of don't know where you're going. And if you're based um, like I am in the country, it's pretty scary rocking up to North Terrace for your first time. Um, but don't be afraid, like, there's a lot of us that are in the same boat as you guys. Um, a lot of people that have never been to Adelaide before until they get accepted here. Um, and we're always happy to help out. Um, you just have to, you know, get up the guts to actually ask for help, which is the hardest thing sometimes. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Pei Jin, or you can call me Sabrina. Firstly, welcome everyone here to Welcome to Sciences. I know you've got your results and you're like, yeah, I'm going to university, but what's next? So that's the exact same question I had when I first came to Adelaide Uni. I'm currently doing a degree in advanced science, going to major in genetics and biochemistry. So if any of you are interested, come and speak to me afterwards. I'll be happy to answer your questions. But of course, you'll get that daunting and excited feeling when you first step into university, but hey, all of us are here, so don't worry and make your first step. So we have a chance for questions from the audience. Okay, I've got a question. What was the scariest thing about coming to the University of Adelaide? What was the scariest thing about coming to the University of Adelaide? Well, if it's from the first year, I think it's because I know no one here when I first came. So I'm like, well, I have to start all over again in a completely new environment, doing something that I know I'll definitely like, that is sciences. But I was kind of worried that if I would get the support I need, if I could speak to somebody, if I came across any problems or if I'm struggling. So that was the problem that I had in mind. But well, I'm in third year now, so all went well. Um, like, like I said before, like being a country student and suddenly rocking up in Adelaide and going from you know 200 people if you're lucky to all of a sudden quite a few thousand and not knowing um, 
where any of your classes are, where any of uh, the events are, um, was certainly pretty scary. Um, but like everything, you just got to kind of like plow through and keep going. So it's, it's not so bad, really. I think my most scariest thing is, is the fact that I felt overwhelmed because I was a mature age student and um, that I was with a lot of young people who um, had been fresh out of school and nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm quite happy to mix with other people, but um, I did find it difficult. Uh, but as I've got along, I've actually got many friends who are younger and who are similar age to myself, and it's been a great experience. Uh, but I just had to just continue turning up and you know going to classes and talking to people because they wouldn't talk to me. So I had to make that step. So yeah, that was my experience. Uh, I actually found the content really difficult at first because. I had a bit of a break between high school in England and coming to uni here. So when I first started, I had a clue what I was doing. And it was actually only until I spoke to my tutors and course coordinator that like, it started to turn around. And yeah, I got through and now I'm doing honours, so something went right. Is there a question? Question for the gentleman, yeah. Just a question on the day when they enrol next year. Um, I know there's an enormous amount of stuff on the website from the page for sciences there, there's probably a lot more content in it, but actually on the day when they rock up, is there like a list of events or a list of things that they go through over the next few days when they first get here? Is it somewhere on the web? Is it something they get in the mail um, that they can attend all the you know, sign up events and things like that? Yes, so after um, students receive their offers, um, we will be sending out information on our enrolment advice session. So that's an opportunity for students to come in and have one-on-one -on -one advice with academics, and then they get assistance with enrolling as well. Um, there's also the O-Week guide that's come out as well, and that's available on the website now too. Um, with the details for enrolment advice session, that will be on the website probably in the first week of January. Do you want to add something? Uh, the, uh the help of enrolling, I remember when I enrolled, I, again, I didn't know how to do it and it can be quite daunting to have to enrol in all your classes but they do have enrolment buddies and uh, events to help you with those and I'd highly recommend going to those because those guys go above and beyond to help you practically show you how to do it all and it's really useful. And a lot of students think that if they do it themselves um, at home rather than coming into the sessions that they'll get into all the times they want or if they wait and come in that they might miss out. It's not the case. Come in, let us help you because we've got staff there that will get you enrolled on that day. So definitely come along. Um, hello. Um, I'm going to be um, enrolling as a mature student as well. Um, and I'm going to be studying part-time because I need to keep working as well, part-time. Um, who's the best person to actually advise me on the best topics to take in each year? Is that on the enrolment day we get to do that kind of thing? Yes, so you'd be able to sit down um, with an academic or with one of us and we can work out a study plan for you so that you enrol into the correct courses to give you that pathway through. Um, so enrolling into your prerequisites each year to, to get you through your program, certainly. Um, and students are welcome to come in to the Faculty of Sciences office at any time, book an appointment, and we can sit down one-on-one -on -one and, and work out study plans with them as well at, at any time or come in at the end of each year before you enrol for the following year. We're happy to do advice the whole way through your program. Just answer. Yeah, I, I actually did get um, help and advice from the Faculty of Science when I was um, when I first um, enrolled, and it was brilliant because um, I had no idea, had no clue. So they were all very helpful, and every every year I've actually sort of gone to also ask for their help and just to get my timetable in, and that I was actually doing the right subjects so that I could. Um, um, basically graduate at the end of my degree, so um, it was very helpful. Um, hello, um, I'm just asking in regards to um, like how flexible the uni like programs are with people getting jobs, as in if they study a certain thing and then they have a job that comes in later on or something, 
and they might need to work during the day and then change their like lessons to a night. Is that like a flexible thing that occurs? Or? Um, so do you mean like flexibility around timetables? Yeah, so with, with the lectures, um, most of those are fairly set. Um, they are mostly recorded, though. We do encourage students to come in um, to those lectures, so if you're not going to be able to make a lecture, definitely speak to the course coordinators. Um, with the tutorials, workshops, practicals, they're pretty flexible as far as where they are throughout the week, and they're, they're not, in the first couple of years, your courses, it won't just be one sort of set time. They're sort of flexible, so you can sort of pick and choose. Um, which ones you go to. Yep. Um, this, this is for the geology one. Um, um, what kind of assignments or research do you guys do? And for the excursions or road trips, um, where about do you go and what do you do mainly? Sorry, what was that again? I couldn't hear. Field um, trips. Oh, field, field trips. In oh, right. Field trips in geology. Um, well, uh, in second year you go, well actually in first year you do go to like Hallett Cove um, or we did uh, Victor Harbour and they were only like day trips so you get to experience some day trips. Um, and in second year we did Pitchy Ritchie so that'll be a week trip. So you get um, instructions, there are always people there helping you. And um, then in tectonics we did um, I did Kangaroo Island, and that was like a four-day field trip. And then if you enrol in third year for the field geoscience, you have, well, I had two weeks in um, Alice Springs, but I think this year they actually had a week in Arcarula. So it, I think it changes. So um, it might change when you um, come to that uh, particular time. So was, is that... All right. Um, also, um, what kind of like research or paperwork? Um, what kind of research? Yeah. Um, well, there's a whole book lot of research um, in regards with geology projects. So it could be like geophysics, or um, it could be igneous and metamorphic um, sort of um, research in, in that way. So they'll be looking at like the Gaula Craton or something like that. So I'll add to that if I can, because um, since I'm head of that school and I'm a geophysicist. So the, the research interests in, in earth science, um, there's, there's a lot of stuff in, in hard rock geology. Um, there's a lot of work on what's called undercover, which is basically trying to understand the mineral resources of Australia that aren't visible from the surface, where the rocks aren't visible from the surface. And that's done uh, mainly through geochemistry and, and through geophysics. Um, Magnetotellurics is a big thing in, in, in the geophysics space. Um, I'm personally an earthquake scientist, and I supervise honor students, but I don't do a lot of um, undergraduate teaching. I just uh, supervise uh, research projects. So there's a, a variety of stuff. In, in, and then there's some, some soft rock geology as well, sedimentology and... and um, that type, type of stuff. That right. I think I believe uh, for geology, there's a program under uh, mineral science, and also there's a program for geology under uh, um, bachelor science, right? As yes, well? that's correct. Yes. So my first question is, what is that, the, the difference between both? And the second one is, if, uh, when, if, if it is under Bachelor of Science, because so many pathways there from geology, chemistry, physics, so when start to, to select the option? It is from the beginning of the program or from where? The Um, so the differences between the Bachelor of Science, Mineral Geoscience, and then doing a Bachelor of Science with a Geology major, is that yes. what you're sort of asking? Yes, yes. So there are some core courses in the Mineral Geoscience program that no other students can do. They're restricted to that program, so there's that unique content there. With the Bachelor of Science, it is a flexible program, so uh, you can sort of pick and choose lots of different pathways. So you may want to major in Geology. Um, but then you may also say, I, I want to major in ecology as well. So you have that flexibility with sort of partnering two different disciplines if you wanted to. Um, 
I suppose that's sort of yeah where, where the differences are. You have a, with the mineral geoscience, it's a lot more structured on your core courses. It definitely um, focuses you into that geology um, area. I'll hand over. <laughs> Just to make a general point on that, so we have what are called named degrees. So a Bachelor of Science in Mineral Geoscience would be an example. A uh, Bachelor of Science in uh, Marine Biology for, would be another. Um, and, and so those have sort of specific routes that people take, and they're designed for people who pretty much think, this is what I want to do. Um, a lot of people going into university don't have a clue, and I'm the great example of that. I went to university thinking I was going to major in, in journalism, and I ended up as a geophysicist. You know, so we don't know. And the nice thing about the general BSc and the BSc Advanced is that you don't have to know what kind of science you want to do. You know you're interested in science, you go, you take a bit of this and you a bit of that, and then you decide, oh, I kind of like that, and God, that's awful. Um, and you choose a pathway, and you ended up, end up choosing a major. So there's a lot more flexibility in the BSc and the BSc Advanced. So either approach works, it just depends on people's interests and how well they know what it is that they, they want to do um, at this age. Um, hi, this is for everyone. Uh, how did you know which science that you want? Like, when did you start to know which science that you wanted to do? Um, well, with my school, they really uh, encouraged to get us to go to university, and they literally just showed us a list of degrees. And I went down, and I saw marine biology, and I thought, yeah, definitely. And that one just stuck for me. So. I didn't even really think about it too much. I, just, I went straight into it. Um, but like what you were saying earlier about Bachelor of Science, I think if you, if you don't know what you, exactly what you want to do, then Bachelor of Science is so flexible. And I had friends who were with me in the same courses the entire degree, and they were doing a Bachelor of Science, and I was just doing the name degree. So it, is, it really is very flexible. Um, the reason why I, I picked um, the Bachelor of Science and majored in Geology, I found that it was, again, flexibility. And I had an interest in, um, in um, doing research, and I wanted to do research in uh, Geology. So I thought, well, I've got to do something. And um, so that's why I chose it. Yeah, kind of for me, because I came back after completing my first degree. I had a, a break um, and worked for six, seven years and then decided to come back again. Um, for me, it was a huge toss-up between whether or not going down the name degree or just the, the plain Bachelor of Science. Um, in the end, I chose the name degree, um, mainly because, uh, again, I wanted to get into research and my research pathway was to do with animals in some capacity. And I liked the ability of the, both the Bachelor of Science and the Bachelor of Science Animal Science that gave me that ability to combine both chemistry, physics and biology together in the one degree and actually get more of a broader overview of um, life systems um, to enable me to actually become a better researcher rather than just, say, focusing only on one particular area. So, the animal science degree here at Adelaide University is probably one of the best in Australia for that reason, because we do um, a bit of chemistry, you know, you have the option of doing some physics, and you do have a broad range of areas that you can actually um, dabble in, so to speak, to come up with a degree that actually suits the areas of interest to you, um, so that if you're looking to go into, say, honours, um, masters or PhD, you actually got some base skills that you can automatically take to the next level without actually having to do, say, additional courses or additional summer school um, to go into the next area. Well, um, for my case, it's a bit special because I came into University of Adelaide with a Bachelor of Science degree. And it was after my first semester I decided to switch into advanced science. So to give you an insight of what I did during first year, I didn't start off by knowing that, oh, yes, genetics and biochemistry and nothing else. I tried so many different courses when I was in first year, including psychology, statistics, ecology, chemistry, and of course, biology itself. And that was when I actually gave myself a chance to experience what science is and its so many fields. 
and that's when I found my passion in genetics and biochemistry. So, and I also find that I'm actually really interested in your research, but I wanted more than what just a degree could offer me by going to lectures and tutorials. I desperately want more, and which is why I actually switched into advanced sciences, because you get the chance to learn from the top researchers in our uni, understanding what their research is about, and you'll get a chance to learn how to actually develop critical thinking, problem-solving skills, and to work alongside top researchers it, it is a really fascinating experience, and which is why I decided to switch to advanced sciences after speaking to the advisors from the Faculty of Sciences. And I think so far it's a really wonderful journey. Sorry, we're just um, wanting to know about when the offers actually come out to everybody. And is, is there a date that you know right now? Sorry, to put you on the spot. There we go. <laughs> so um, some students may have already got some offers. Um, so students who have applied using that ATAR, though, um, yeah, first round offers come out January 17th. So are they all through the mail or are they emailed? Um, I'm uh, SATAC send those out, and I think it's by email that they do it. I'm not sure if they also do a hard copy. So that's the first round. The second round is what date? Um, I'd have to look, but it's, it's normally they do them sort of twice a week, oh. yeah, on a rolling basis. It just depends on demand. What about guarantees and entry? So we, if you believe you've got a guarantee and entry, what does that really mean? Does that mean you're going to get that offer, but it's, you're guaranteed you don't have to accept it? So if you have um, received an offer for your first preference, is that what you mean, how it's automatically accepted if on If you've your got an, the high enough ATAR to get in directly. Sorry? If your ATAR is high enough, obviously, to get into the degree, you've got a guaranteed entry. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. As long as you've met the prerequisites and the ATAR is high enough. I mean, the, the cutoffs with the ATAR can fluctuate year to year, so until that first round comes out, um, that's, that's the round that's based on the ATAR. That, that will be when we find out what the ATAR cutoff is. And that, uh, that ATAR is not known yet? Um, so you can look at previous um, years, which is available on the website under Degree Finder. Um, it should show the last, I think, three years they have on there. It gives you a bit of a rough guide, but just be, it can fluctuate a little bit year to year, though. Could you enlighten us? Like, do you know what it, what it roughly is? Uh, or, or every single program is different. doing is, is, is doing a double major and um, I'm interested, the, the problem is that I've got two equally burning passions that belong in two separate named degrees. The first one is purple necked rock wallabies which falls under wildlife conservation biology and I'm also interested in guinea pigs which falls under animal science. So. Do I really have to make a choice? Can I can I do a double major in in, in both of those? Is there some way that I can in, in incorporate both of my passions? Okay, so um, as far as animal science is concerned, um, in animal science we do have an, um, kind of because we're focused not on domestic species, we actually do um, a fair bit on wildlife species as well. So there is an opportunity for you to actually. Um, engage with uh, a wildlife species that is of importance to you. Um, in terms of majoring in it, animal science doesn't really have, we don't actually have majors per se, um, because we're designed to uh, facil facilitate basically a, a research-based pathway as opposed to the veterinary sciences, which obviously go into the, um, the doctorate of veterinary, was it doctorate of veterinary masters or something or other? Um, which is, is slightly different. So there's opportunity for you to kind of study um, 
more broader aspects of it through animal science, if that makes sense, where wildlife and conservation, from what I understand, um, is more about the environmental systems that they're based in. So where we deal directly more with the animals and their physiology, um, the wildlife conservation, I believe, deal more with the environments. But the timetable clashes would be immense, unfortunately, to do both degrees. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to broaden this and um, introduce some of our members of staff now who will also be available to, to talk up the stairs in a minute. Maybe Phil could come forward first because um, he's in biological sciences and might want to say something about wildlife conservation biology. Well, I think you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Phil Cassie and I'm a lecturer in uh, the School of Biological Sciences. I'm an ecologist and I study uh, conservation biology, wildlife trade, and uh, biosecurity planning. Uh, I also have the, the great privilege of being the program coordinator for the BSc Advanced, uh, which is a vocational research pathway uh, for uh, young, young researchers who, uh, as we've heard, is, is a very exciting experience. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm not from around these parts. Uh, I'm a, a New Zealander, a Kiwi by descent. Uh, but I've also I've worked uh, in uh, Europe, the UK and North America and I'm very proud to, to now call Adelaide home and sitting here and thinking about what Sandy was saying and listening to the, the research uh, and scientific opportunities, uh, a lot of it gels very strongly with me and it's a, it's a great place to be studying science. So I'm happy to take any questions. Or you can keep asking the students questions. They probably know more than me anyway. <laughs> Let's inter let the others. Oh, go ahead. What? Um, I'm going to take the biotechnology program. So uh, my question is that uh, will our classes involve a lot of um, physics and mathematics? No, they're not cool courses. Sorry, because I'm um, not really familiar with so, Because this is the first year I came to uh, Australia, so I'm not very familiar with the uh, education system in Australia. So um, I want to ask, uh, do I need to uh, prepare, uh, I mean, like recite some terms about physics and mathematics? Because uh, I'm going to take the biotechnology programs next year. So with the biotechnology program, physics um, isn't a core course and maths isn't. You could um, choose those courses as electives, but you don't have to do those courses. Yeah. Chris, do you want to come? Good evening. My name is Chris Ford. I'm the deputy head of school for learning and teaching at the Wake Campus. So I represent the School of Agriculture, Food and Wine. We have four degrees at the Wake Campus, the Bachelor of Agricultural Sciences, Bachelor of Food and Nutrition Science, Bachelor of Viticulture and Enology, and the Bachelor of Applied Biology. As you can tell, perhaps by my accent, I too am not from here. I've been in Australia. I worked out today 26 years, so it's Always very exciting to be standing here meeting new students for the first time and thinking back to when I was a student in the UK, having completely stuffed up my equivalent of ATAR and not got to my first choice university and gone to something called a polytechnic, which was a little bit off the radar. But I have to say it was absolutely brilliant. The thing I remember from that most of all was just going and meeting all sorts of new people and taking every opportunity that was thrown my way. Wonderful time and uh, I wish I could do it again. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, that never works. <laughs> um, hello. I'm looking at doing the Bachelor of Science Advanced, but I also have a passion for chemistry, uh, not chemistry, psychology. I was wondering if it would be possible to pick up some psychology units along the way and how I would go about doing that. So broadening is strongly encouraged within uh, the, the university and particularly within the sciences. Um, from, from my own personal perspective, uh, 
I'm extremely interdisciplinary in, in the way that I conduct my research and teaching, and I think it's incredibly important that uh, you're, you think as broadly as you can as, as soon as you get here. Um, the greatest advances come from interdisciplinary research. Uh, there's a lot of lip service which is paid to interdisciplinary research, uh, and it's not, it's not always uh, rewarded in the, the same quantum, uh, but the, the greatest advances uh, tend to come from uh, knowledge in other disciplines. And, and absolutely, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for, for those broadening electives. So no problem at all, and strongly encouraged. Hi. Um, with the wildlife conservation biology, is that intended as a research pathway degree? So uh, all of the, the name degrees uh, are designed uh, around specific uh, research interests or, or pathways, and, and certainly um, the, uh, the wildlife conservation degree is, is no exception. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the job market is fierce for, uh, for all of us, and uh, so there's, there's no uh, certainties uh, around it, but as we, we see the, the huge extinction crisis that we're, we're headed for, um, the, the brightest and able minds that we have in wildlife conservation, the better. So it's, um, there's, there's fantastic opportunities during the, the third year capstone components, which is the, the final year research parts of, of that degree uh, for interrelationships with the Department of Environment. And uh, uh, those uh, relationships which are being bridged um, allow for, for great vocational opportunities. So absolutely. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name's Rachel Norris and I'm, I'm here representing the Roseworthy campus uh, tonight. Um, I'm the program coordinator for the um, veterinary bioscience program and as uh, Carolyn's also um, told you, we run a Bachelor of Animal Science um, program at Roseworthy as well. So um, yes, if you are interested in animals and have a research interest, the Bachelor of Animal Science program is a, a very good program for you to do. If you're more inter interested in the health, uh, preventative medicine and well-being of animals, then the veterinary degree um, will um, be more suited for you. Um, the veterinary degree is actually running two programs which are interlinked. You can't do one without the other. Uh, there's the undergraduate program, which is the veterinary bioscience program, which um, is where you will enrol into it. And then Extending on from that is another three-year postgraduate degree, which is the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine. So it's uh, six years. It's a very full-on course. Um, you cannot do it part-time. Um, and so it uh, requires a huge commitment if um, that's where you're um, intending to go. So um, I'm an Adelaide girl. I did my undergraduate degree at Adelaide. I did my high degree at Adelaide. I now work at Adelaide. I like to think that my movement was 40... 53 kilometres north to Roseworthy. Um, so I'm happy to explain anything about Roseworthy and how you get there and all the rest of it in the break. Thanks. Um, I just have a question. I'm interested in doing veterinary science, um, but I'm not sure if I'll get in because it's pretty competitive. I've been told you can do a year of animal science and then transfer over. Is it very difficult to do that? Um, yeah, that's absolutely correct. You can do um, first year of Bachelor of Animal Science if you select uh, your subjects correctly, and the key one is to select um, physics. Um, and there is an opportunity um, at the end of the year to, um, because the two degrees are the same then, and you do a common first year program, um, four days of your first year program in the veterinary science and animal science degrees here at North Terrace and one day is the Roseworthy day where you come and do specific um, animal handling and animal behaviour um, ethics and welfare courses out at Roseworthy. So there is an opportunity if you don't get the ATAR or you're not selected through the interview uh, in this year um, to enrol in the Bachelor of Animal Science, you, you then, you know, you can either then um, try again, um, you can use your GPA if your marks are you know, are nice and robust, um, but you'd have to go through that same 
um, particular interview system that we have, which is the questionnaire, uh, selection for interview, and then the academic um, uh, qualifications. The um, movement from um, first year into second year, there are, there are limited places, so that makes it even more competitive for that pathway entry now, but it's, uh, it's being done, so. question regarding Bachelor of Medical and Health Science. So we can't hear you? Bachelor of Medical and Health Science. I have a question regarding uh, Bachelor of Health and Medical Science. Mm -hmm. I want to be a dietitian, so I'm planning to do a Master in Dietetics as well. I want to know if the course of Bachelor of Health and Medical Science helps me. Like I can do this course, the Bachelor of Health and Medical Science, um, choose nutrition, the and then further on the Master in Dietetics. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's try to talk about that upstairs because that's a different faculty from us. Okay. So it's not our area of expertise, but we'll, uh, Kiralee in particular, will uh, try to help um, with your question, but let's defer that one to, to upstairs in a minute. Um, are there any other questions for this group as a group, or do you want to start talking to people individually? Um, I've noticed on the website there are a lot of options for double degrees with the Bachelor of Science. Um, are there any possible study plans for double degrees with the Bachelor of Science Advanced? So yeah, there's, uh, there's opportunities for, for double degrees. They're, they're a little more constrained because of the core courses that are taken uh, at each year through the the BSc Advanced, uh, and in your, your final year, you have to choose a first major uh, because that makes up your, your capstone for your uh, third year research component of that major. But that doesn't mean that you can't, there are, there are a lot of students graduating who come through uh, who have the requirements for a, a double major during the BSc Advanced, but you've only done your research component in the Advanced degree uh, through a, a single subject. And um, who should I go and see regarding uh, developing a study plan for a double degree with the advanced program? <laughs> who are we looking at here? <laughs> Everyone seems to be. Uh, so yeah, uh, you're welcome to talk to me in the break uh, and Kiralee uh, uh, as, as well. Either, either of us can, can help you out. And, you know, take up the enrolment advice sessions. You know, don't feel that, that uh, you need to solve or answer all your questions with us tonight. The enrolment advice sessions are really important. They're a fantastic opportunity uh, for you to engage uh, with staff in those disciplines. Yeah. Just re I'll just reinforce that, that, that the enrolment advice sessions are very, very worthwhile. So, are there any other questions for the group or shall we? Yep, one, one more down here and then we'll, we'll break and we'll chat with people up the, um, in the foyer. Oh, hi. Uh, talking about the study plans, what's the maximum number of units allowed per semester? So per semester, it's 12 units for most programs. Some will allow you to overload to 15 units, but I wouldn't recommend doing that in your first semester. <laughs> so 12 units is a 100% study load full time. Okay, thank you everybody and thanks very much to our students and staff for standing up here and trying to answer questions. So we've got some light refreshments um, up in the foyer and we'll all be around to try to answer your questions. So thanks again and we'll chat with you upstairs. <laughs>